Welcome. We're going to be doing Matthew chapter 11 in this session. It's going to be very interesting because I'm going to be touching on something that I never heard preached before, and you probably never heard this preached before either. That is, why did John the Baptist doubt that Yeshua, Jesus, was the Messiah when he was in prison? I mean, here's the guy who introduced Jesus to the world as the Messiah. I mean, he introduced, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, anyway, let's get into this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. When Yeshua, when Jesus had finished directing his 12 disciples, now we dealt with this last time, uh, Matthew chapter 10, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in the prison the works of the Messiah, Christ, uh, the word Messiah and the word Christ means the same thing. Mashiach, Messiah, Christ, it all means the same thing. So when John in prison heard the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you he who comes or should we lo look for another? Now, let's stop here again. And let's think uh, together about this, okay? John, the one that was sent by the Lord to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus. He's the one that introduced Jesus, you know, as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And by the way, he said, takes away the sin, not covers up, winks at, or, you know, ignores. No, takes it away. That means if you are addicted to sin, that addiction is taken away from you. You are now free from that addiction and you're free to live in holiness and obedience to God. So anyway, just had to say that. John said, behold the lamb of God who, who takes away the sin of the world. And then later on, he, I mean, he gets arrested. He gets put in prison and now he's like, well, is Jesus the Messiah or is he not? Is he the Christ? Is he the one uh, that is to come or should we look for another? Why would he think like this? Why would he, why would he ask this question? Why would he be questioning whether or not Jesus was the Messiah? Well, think about it now. Here is John. He is in prison. Jesus said he is the there's nobody, no man born of woman that is greater than John the Baptist. He's a man that is so, so precious in the eyes of God. A man whom, whom God himself sent to prepare the way. A man of whom it was prophesied in Malachi. Malachi. A man that is so vital to the whole story of the gospel of, uh, of Jesus. Yet he is in prison. Jesus is outside. Can you imagine? He's sitting in prison. And he hears about what's going on just outside. Jesus is outside. Why doesn't Jesus... I mean, Jesus is doing all these miracles outside. Jesus is in town. Jesus is just so far away from me. Why doesn't he come and rescue me? Why doesn't he come and get me out of prison? I mean, after all... The scriptures do say that the Messiah will free those that are in prison, does it not? Okay, let's skip on over to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, let me see this for a second here. Isaiah chapter 61. The Lord Yahuwah Spirit is on me, or... The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, as some translation says, or the Spirit of the Lord. The Lord Yahweh's Spirit is on me because Yahuwah has anointed me to preach good news to the humble. Now, we know this is Jesus. Uh, really, it's talking about Jesus here because, you know, Jesus actually read this in synagogue and said this is about him. He has sent me. This is talking about Jesus. He has sent Jesus to bind up the brokenhearted, to, pro to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release those who are bound. Now, uh, you know, 
I think John the Baptist would certainly know this scripture. I think it was well known at that in that time. I mean, hey, I mean, this was really foundational to everybody in that day and age in that culture. Um, Isaiah was a very famous prophet and still is a, a very famous prophet. And everybody knew that Isaiah wrote this and said that the Christ, or more or less the the one whom God sends, the one to come, will set at liberty those who are captive, release those who are bound. Now, let's go on over to uh, the book of Psalms. Psalms 146, verse 7, talking about the Lord. It says, uh, who executes ju- justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Yahuwah, or Yahweh, or as some translate, some translations put it, the Lord, frees the prisoners. So, yeah, uh, I'm sure John is probably thinking, isn't it like God's heart for me to be free? Isn't it God's will for me to be free? Isn't it the Lord, doesn't the Lord want me to be free? Is what the scripture says. So why am I still in prison and why hasn't Jesus come to rescue me? Okay, you think about it now. You think about what it would be like to be John the Baptist in prison. And Jesus is right outside. You can ask him any question you want. At least John, you know, did so through his disciples. I guess this would be a pressing question. Um, Lord, are you really the one to come? Here I am in prison. Are you the one to come to set at liberty those who are captive? That's why I believe that Jesus, um, that, excuse me, John kind of questioned that because he's in prison and Jesus is nearby. Why? You know, questions, questions, questions. Back to um, Matthew chapter 11. Verse 4, Jesus answered them, this is John's disciples, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. You're firsthand witnesses here. You are eyewitnesses. Go tell John what the things that you hear and you see right now. <laughs> that you see, uh, Things that you hear and things that you see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf Here, the dead are raised up and the poor have the good news news preached to them. Blessed is he who finds no occasion for stumbling in me. Now, let's go back here to the first scripture reference here where it says, uh, where Jesus said, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. Isaiah 35. Verse 5 says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf would be unstopped, the la- then the lame man will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing, for, the, for waters will break out in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So, Jesus was quote, quoting from Isaiah. Jesus was quoting from Isaiah here. Uh, Back to Matthew chapter 11. Uh, The second scripture reading is, uh, reference I should say, is exactly what we read before. Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 4. I mean, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he's anointed me to, you know, to preach good news to the poor, to set up, uh, set uh, set at liberty the captives and on and on and on it goes. Verse 6, I find it very, very interesting that Yeshua would throw this phrase in there. Blessed is he who finds no occasion for stumbling in me. In other words, you'll be blessed if you're not offended at me. You're blessed if you don't get angry with me. Why would he say that? Well, obviously, you know, we can boil this down to, I mean, I don't want to get in two of the nitty gritty in this, at this point in time, at this stage, but we can, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are passages you know, in in uh, in previous scriptures in the so-called Old Testament, that 
refer to, you know, blessed are those who are not offended. Uh, blessed are those who are not, who don't stumble, uh, you know, that find no occasion of stumbling in, in the Lord. But you see, Yeshua said this because he knew that the way he taught and his mannerisms, I mean, here, I mean, we just went through how many chapters of him just blatantly not po- apologizing for his behavior when people were angry with him. I mean, when people were angry with him, how many times did he just kind of rub it in even more or just or just, just nail it to the floor even harder? So Jesus taught very hard and strict and people got angry. That's why he said, you're blessed. By the way, blessed are, are, are the ones who are not offended by me. If he was just lovey-dovey, kind of hippie Jesus that you see in most churches anymore, he would have no reason to say this. Why would a lovey-dovey, kiss and hug the trees kind of Jesus, why would he even say that, why would he even think that somebody might be offended at him? It comes to mind the uh, the famous uh, the famous quotation from a preacher of old that said if if Jesus preached the way preachers do today in church if preachers if Jesus preached like that he would never have been crucified you got to understand these people were angry with him they were angry over and over and over again he had to slip away from them because they were ready to kill him. They were ready to throw him off a cliff at one point. They were ready to stone him. They were ready to kill him over and over again. But he gave it to him, and he gave it to him really, really good. So verse 7, as these went their way, the disciples of John the Baptist, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John. Now, this is very interesting. This is the words in red, the words in red, my friend. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man in soft clothing? Did you go out to see his nice pretty clothes that he was wearing? Behold, those... Behold is another word for look or take notice or take note of this. Those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes. Yes. I tell you, and much more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. This is in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Again, Yeshua is quoting the so-called Old Testament over and over and over and over again. If you preach like Jesus, you'll do the same. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus quoted, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Jesus was saying very clearly here that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of that. Most certainly I tell you, said Jesus, among those who are born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the baptizer. Wow. Really? Think about this for a minute. Think about the patriarchs. Think about the fathers in the faith. Think about all those who have come before him. What a statement. What a statement that Jesus was making. I tell you, let's read this again. I I tell you, among those who are born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. What did John do? He preached against sin. That's why he was in prison. He preached repentance. Jesus had nothing negative to say about that. He he had all the opportunity right here to say, well, I like the message and well, he had a good heart, but I didn't like the method. I didn't like him out there preaching. Preaching the way he did, it was kind of harsh. 
He called people vipers and he said they were going to be burned by the Lord. He said that they were like chaff before the, they're, they're, they were going to be burned up in hell. And he, even people who came to repent, he, he said, who warned you of the wrath to come? You don't even deserve to come here. You are such a sinner. You're such a hypocrite. You're just pretending. Imagine if a pastor said that in church today. Hmm. The more and more you read the Bible, the more and more you see how churches today are not even, <laughs> they're not even there at all. They're not even close to the way they should be. So Jesus had all the opportunity right here. He, he spoke a lot about John the Baptist here. He could have said, he could have said if he wanted to. He could have said, well, John the Baptist, he was a good guy and he, was, he had his time. And, but, you know, I didn't really quite like his style. He had nothing negative to say. What he said was absolutely awesome. Absolutely amazing. I tell you, among those who are born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the baptizer. Yet, Jesus continues, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. When he's, when he's talking about here is humility don't try to be the great. Don't try to climb up. Don't try to be, you know, the, the great. Try to, you know, be humble. Verse 12, from the days of John, the baptizer, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Or plunder it, it says here. Now, Think about what that means. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. It means pe people are pushing into the kingdom of heaven. People are storming the gates of heaven. The violent take it by force. You need to press into God, my friend. You need to press into God. You need to be serious about your relationship with Jesus. Don't let him just be another little trinket up on the shelf. Don't let him be just a little thing that you do on Sunday morning. Be serious about Jesus. Be serious about God. Say to God when you get up in the morning, am I thinking right? Am I thinking, uh, you, am I thinking the way you want me to think? Is it according to your law and according to your ways? When you get dressed, am I dressing properly? Yes. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Am I dressing properly? According to the scriptures, according to the word of God. When you go to work, am I working? The, am I working? Am I doing what I should be doing? Am I doing anything that's violating the Torah? Am I doing anything that's violating God's ways as shown to us clearly in the scriptures? When we come home, when you come home from work, and in the evening, when you got some free time, if you have any, a lot of people don't, but you know what I'm talking about. Do you say, oh, Father, am, am I doing what you want me to do? A lot of people are like, well, what does God want me to do? Well, if you're in doubt of what God wants you to do, I'm pretty sure you probably got a Bible not too far from you. Okay? You don't need to go to the nearest prophet, so to speak. Open the scriptures. You've got over a thousand pages sitting right there of the word of God. Okay. Verse 13, for all the prophets and the Torah, the law prophesied until John, if you are willing to receive it, this is Elijah. It's because you see, in the book of Malachi, or the Hebrew properly said, Malachi, it is prophesied that Elijah will come. So Jesus said in verse 14, if you're willing to receive it, if you can, if you can understand, if you really, if you know what I'm talking about, and if you can, if you can receive it, this is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. There are a lot of people that don't have ears to hear. Really. I'm just so amazed at how many people, they look at the Bible, they look at the scriptures right dead on. They read it right there. 
black and white, and yet they absolutely don't see it. <laughs> they hear it. They hear the words, but they don't hear it. I'm amazed that so many people, you know, it's like you tell them, you know, God said, I, 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 I change not. I never change. And it's just kind of like a 747 right over their head. They don't need, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah, but. No. Uh, God said it. And that's what he means. Verse 16. But to what shall I compare this generation? Now, is he talking about his generation, so to speak? Well, you know, you could take it that way. This generation could also mean the whole race of the whole human race from Adam until now. Okay. What shall I compare this generation? It's, it's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call to their, their, their companions, their friends and say, we danced, we, 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 we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We played the flute for you. You didn't dance. What's the matter with you? We mourned for you, and you. We mourned for you, and you didn't lament. You you didn't join us. You well, you're not you're not joining us. You're not playing with us. For John came neither eating nor drinking. He was a very unique individual in his day. He came neither eating nor drinking. That doesn't mean he. He fasted all of his life, um, but it just means he wasn't gluttonous. Um, he wasn't a guy who feasted all the time, uh, drinking. He didn't, he didn't get drunk and this kind of stuff. For uh, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, fasting and, and such. And, and behold, they said, they, they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. And this is in the NU. Again, this is uh, what most scholars believe to be the oldest manuscripts reads actions instead of children. So wisdom is justified by her actions. Let me point out, Jesus said that he comes eating and drinking doesn't mean that he's a glutton he's a glutton or he's a drunkard it, it, it amazes me how many people and we got one of these famous christian bands that made a song about jesus friend of sinners but this is you need to, you need to understand this is false accusations here jesus said that they come and they said Be, look at uh, there's a gluttonous man and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners I got another video called Jesus wasn't a friend of sinners or Jesus a friend of sinners. Um, no, he really, really wasn't. He spent his, he spent, I mean, there was, Jesus's ministry was twofold. Number one, he was rebuking the hypocrites, rebuking sin and sinners and healing the sick, healing those who came to him in repentance, really repentant. Okay. See, now, a lot of people would say, well, you know, you know, the Pharisees say that he was a, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was a friend of sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. And then a lot of these Christians, I don't understand how they can do this. They, they go, oh, yeah, Jesus was a friend of sinners. What, so now you're, you're teaming up with the Pharisees in false accusation against him? Who did Jesus say was sinners? Who were really the sinners? It was the Pharisees. It wasn't the people that, it wasn't the people who came to Jesus that the Pharisees thought Pharisees thought that were they were sinners. The people that the Pharisees thought were sinners were either holy righteous men or they were ex-sinners. They were people who came to Jesus in humility and in repentance. They didn't understand. If you repented, you're not like that anymore. You're a different person. They didn't, oh, you're the same person. You are, a, you know, once a thief, always a thief. No, it's not the case. If you're born again, you are a new creation. That's what the Pharisees didn't understand. That's why they said to Jesus, he's a friend of sinners. No, he wasn't the friend of sinners. He rebuked the sinners vehemently. 
He called them sons of Satan. He called them whitewashed tombs. Like, yeah, you look so good on the outside, but inside, you're in inside, you're full of dirty, filthy, rotten, stinking, rotten flesh. The most putrid. Friend of sinners? It's a joke. He, rebu he rebuked the sinners. The sinners got mad at him. The sinners eventually cried out, crucify him. No, he wasn't a friend of sinners. He was a friend of repentant sinners, which means you used to be a sinner. You're not a sinner. You're not a sinner anymore. Okay. Verse 20, then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his muddy works had been done because they didn't repent. See, there we go again. How many people don't see this? How many people don't understand this? Well, Jesus came so that we could just trust in him because of his mercy and grace. That is not what the scriptures say. Where do you get that from? From some ear-tickling feel-good preacher? On TV? Or at church? Why did he, he, okay, put it this way. Verse 20 makes it very clear that he denounced the cities in which his mighty works have been done, that his miracles have been done, because they didn't repent. So, hello, what does that tell you? The, the purpose of his miracles, at least one of the primary purposes of his miracles, were, it was to drive people to repentance. He wanted people to repent. Number one. It's the first word he said. It's the first thing he said. It's the first thing he preached. Repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <laughs> I often say it's the last word he said to his church in, Re in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And he said it more than once. Trust me. Verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe means cursing if you don't know what that means. It means cursing. He called curses down on cities, not just individuals. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Where? He did not only just curse individuals at certain occasions and certain times. He cursed groups of people. Pharisees, the Sadducees, the hypocrites, the sinners, the real sinners, the Pharisees, that is, and people like them or anybody else that was uh, not living or thinking or doing what God wanted them to do. Woe means cursing. Not only did Jesus curse individuals, he cursed in groups of people and he, he cursed entire cities. Think about this for a minute. Again, again, I know a lot of you might have a hard time with this because you've grown up all your life in church. You've heard about it or you've, you've heard other people talk about it or, you, or, or you've heard some famous preacher on TV say it. But this is the truth. This is the truth. This is the way Jesus really is, really, really was and is. So, yeah, Jesus called curses down on entire cities. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were done in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Again, you see, you see the, 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 the purpose of miracles? Hello, preacher. Hi, miracle worker preacher. Hi there, faith healer. If, if your miracles, if the miracles that happen, I'll put it this way, because I know a lot of these preachers say, well, it's not me, it's God. So, I mean, a lot of these preachers, not all of them, but a lot of these preachers, they, they just, they, they don't say it directly, but whether, what they say is, they imply, well, look at how, what God is doing through my ministry. But listen, listen, faith healer, listen, preacher, listen, miracle preacher. If people are not repenting in your meetings because of your miracles, forget it. Forget it. It's, 
I'm not even going to say it. Verse 22, but I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you, you Capernaum. Now, this is a, this is a village. This is a city that started out really good. Cap, Cap, Capernaum is coming from the Hebrew. It's a it's an English transliteration of the Greek, which is a transliteration of the original Hebrew, which is Kafer Nahum, which means Kafer means village, Nahum Nahum, the prophet Nahum, the prophet Nahum that we read about in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament. Uh, you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, you're so proud, you will go down to Hades. You will go down to hell. You will go down to hell. For if the mighty works, okay, just a second here. I just got to say this. Jesus condemned an entire city to hell. This is the Jesus of the Bible. Every church likes to think that they are, every preacher, every Christian likes to think that they're the true way, the, the, the Bible way. If you're the true Bible way, you, okay, you know what I'm thinking. For if the mighty works had been done in Sodom, which were done in you, it would have been, it would have remained until today. Wow. What a powerful statement that is. Sodom, that God rained down, you know, soft brimstone, whatever you call fire. I think it was probably a volcano that erupted and just rained down on Sodom, just like it, just like it happened in Pompeii, not that long ago, relatively speaking. Just after the time of Christ here, Pompeii, you know, was just engulfed in lava, in fire, in liquid, liquid fire. <sighs> Yeah, so was Sodom. Why? Because of her sin. But Jesus said, if the mighty works that were done in Sodom, if they had been done in Sodom, the same works that was done in you, it would have remained until today. Why? Because Sodom would have repented. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Hmm. When God moves among you, when God does miracles, it's for the at least one of the primary purposes. I know you can say God works miracles because of his compassion for people. Yes, but as you see here very clearly, primary purpose here is, is, is to, to lead you to repentance, to cause you to repent. If that doesn't happen... I don't know what to say. Verse 24. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. And same with today. With so many churches and so many cities and so many countries just diving head, head first into sin. It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for you. Why? You have lots of Bibles all over. You have lots of the scriptures all over, in and out, in your churches, in your homes, on the internet, everywhere. You've got churches all over the place that's supposed to be teaching the, the truth. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have, we didn't, they don't, didn't have Bibles like we have. We have more responsibility than they, than they had. Yet God was so angry with them, they were just engulfed. They were just eaten up by fire alive. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered, I thank you, Father. Now he's praying. A few times you see throughout the scriptures, you see a record of Jesus actually praying. This is one of his prayers. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise and understanding and re revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for so it was well-pleasing you in your sight that all things 
have been delivered to me by my Father. So you see, let me stop here for a second. God reveals things. God is not looking for biological strength. He's not looking for worldly wisdom. He's looking for someone who's humble. You've hidden these things, Jesus said, from the wise and understanding. What things? Things that are more profound than the wisdom of this world could ever, ever accept. And revealed them to infants. A lot of times a little child would be able to tell you better than some of these high-fluking university students. 26. Yes, Father, for it was well-pleasing in your sight. Verse 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Neither does anyone know the Father except the Son and he to whom the Son desires to reveal him. There are certain people that Jesus chooses. Certain people. Certain people. He to whom the Son desires to reveal him. I don't think that Jesus desires that everybody know the Father, have the Father revealed to him them like he's talking about here. Otherwise, it wouldn't be holy. It would be common. The common would become holy, and the holy would be common, and that's just, it wouldn't be any holiness anymore, really. Verse 28. And this is a favorite of a lot of people, okay? Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Excuse me. There is a yoke. What's a yoke? A yoke is one of those wooden things that's being that, that they put around like an ox or whatever, like in, and, and they put it around their neck and they, they make these animals walk in a circle. And they, they attach it to like a, a millstone where they grind wheat and all that kind of stuff. And this is a yoke. A yoke is a sign of work. Okay. So there is a yoke. Yeah, there is work. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Okay. A lot of people don't really know what humble really is. Now think about this. This is the same person. This is the same Jesus who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. This is the same Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If people said that today, they would, people would say, oh, you're, so, you're very arrogant. No. You can say that and still be very, very humble. He said, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See? I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for your souls. A lot of people today, you need rest. Yes, there's a lot of people. You need rest. How do you get rest? Be humble. Be humble. Swallow your pride. Bite the bullet. Swallow the pride. Get rid of it. Humble yourself. Take the yoke of Jesus upon you. Yeah. He's got a yoke to put around your neck. Yes, he does. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy. Again, this reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 30. After the, the, uh, all the commandments came down and after, after uh, Moses you know, was, uh, was, it received the commandments of God and all this kind of stuff and, and, and shared it with the, with the people of Israel... And, you know, near the end of, of, of the books of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30, it just basically says, 
the commandments that I just give you, they're easy to obey. It's easy. It's the same thing as what Moses said about the Torah. It's easy. Easy. Okay? After all, Moses prophesying about Jesus, he said, the prophet that comes is like me. Like me. Like Moshe. Like Moshe. Like the lawgiver. How many people today would look at Jesus and say, oh, yeah, yeah, like Moses. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As John said, his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments being the commandments that we read throughout all of Scripture from the beginning to now. My burden is light. What an awesome chapter to read. What an awesome, awesome privilege that we, that we have to actually read the, the writings of, of the scriptures in this gospel. As you go your way, may God bless you and enlighten you and give you understanding above all your peers. Meditate upon the, the scriptures. Med meditate upon his word. You're commanded to do so. and You'll be blessed. So as you, as you go your way, may the peace of God rest upon you and may God bless you with great understanding and with the gift of repentance. Thank you.